Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three, test, test, test. Can I get a thumbs up if you could hear me clearly? We can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Testing, testing, testing. This is a test. Chris, can you hear me? Hi, Paolo. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Three more minutes, everyone. We'll begin in exactly three more minutes. I see Trustee Philbeck and Trustee Alvarez. Is Trustee Lopez and Trustee Ruelas here yet? Lopez is here. Hey, Mark. Good afternoon. All right, one more minute, everybody, one more minute. And for those listening in, thank you for joining us this afternoon for our special board meeting, July 16th, 
2020. We will begin in exactly one minute. All right. Everybody with us, Chris? Yes, everyone's here. Let's do it. All right, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District July 16th special board meeting. I am AESD board president, Paulo McAllis, and I call this meeting to order at exactly 1 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of this meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows by calling 219-281-4401. And then when asked to type in the pin, I want you to put 518 Seven seven five, followed by the pound sign. Para español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera: llame al dos seis cero dos dos siete siete tres uno nueve. Cuando se le pida presione el pin tres cinco Nuevo o nueve cero ocho ocho siete siete uno el simbolo pound. Any member of the public has an opportunity to address the board by submitting comments by 12 p.m. on Thursday, July 16th, 2020, online via an electronic fillable form linked on our AESD.org homepage as outlined in the public speakers portion of this agenda. Submissions will be read aloud during the board meeting by the board, the board president or designee. All right, let's go ahead and begin with our flag salute. Please put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Moving on to item 1B, introductions and roll call and microphone check. Ryan A. Ruelas, board member. Present. Jackie Philbeck, board member. Um, Jackie, are you with us? There we go. Sorry, I was having some issues. Um, present, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Trustee Philbeck. Trustee Lopez. Present. And our board clerk, Juan G. Alvarez. Present. I'm also president, President Paulo McAllis. Our superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing. Present. Good afternoon, everyone. Our assistant superintendent of Ed Services, Dr. Mary Grace. Present. Our assistant superintendent of Human Resources, Dina Milan. Present. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Our our Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services, Michael Kraus. Hello. Good afternoon, Elsa President. <laughs> Good afternoon. Followed by Elsa Covarrubias, our Director Ready? of Communication. Um, present. Iris Camacho, our Senior Administrative Assistant. 
present. And welcome, Iris. Followed by our interpreters, Mary Madrigal and Alina Rogue. Roque, presente. Welcome. Our technology assistants, Janice Cato and Darren Brown. Yeah, what are you present. up to? Good afternoon. Hello, I'm the suit Hello present. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right, let's go ahead and move on to item 1C, the adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved, Rellis. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. Hearing none, let's go ahead and do our roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Trustee Philbeck. It appears that there's something wrong with her computer, Paulo. So I think that she should just call in. But she did give a thumbs up as I. So. Okay. Thank you, Trustee Rowellas. Uh, will that mm -hmm. thumbs up work, Chris? Yes, but if board member Philback calls back, we can still have her weigh in. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, I just I just got it through. The problem I'm having is not being able to unmute. The button is not working. You know, I've been trying this whole time and finally got it to unmute. So that's the issue I'm having, which I haven't had before. So um, yes, I vote aye, and hopefully we can get this resolved. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what the issue. That's what the problem I'm having is the button will not unmute. So somebody maybe can unmute me. I don't know. Ah, uh, okay. Jackie. For President, um, this is Elsa. Uh, Jackie, why don't you go ahead and leave yourself unmuted? I don't hear any background noise right now, so I don't okay. think there should be any issue with yourself being unmuted. And um, unfortunately, we are not able to unmute participants. Only they can. So I think that's the best uh, strategy at this moment, if you're yeah, okay with no, that. There's nothing else going on. Uh, it's quiet. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Elsa. And thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to item 2A, public speakers for closed session agenda items. Tonight we have a total and received 120 public comments as indicated in the meeting agenda. The board shall limit the total time for each agenda item to 20 minutes. But in the best interest of the public, the public comment time will be extended to 30 minutes to allow for additional comments to be read. While not all public comments submitted will be read aloud, all public comments submitted were provided or will be provided to the board for their review. Additionally, all public comments that were submitted will be posted with the meeting minutes and accessible by the public on our website. To follow, Elsa Covarrubias, our Director of Communications, and Dr. Mary Grace, our Assistant Superintendent of Ed Services, will be reading in the order that they were received within the 30-minute time frame that has been established. So you may begin, Elsa. Thank you. What I'm going to do is set my timer on my phone so that um, we can have the exact uh, 30 minutes and um, read as many comments as possible. So I will start that now. Um, first comment. Submitted by Rachel, an AESD parent. I know this is a touchy subject for everyone, including the teaching staff. I want my kids in school. My soon-to-be first grader has ADD and does not benefit from the virtual learning. He needs to be in school. He needs to have hands-on learning and to social with other children. I would like to have the option to send my kids back to school as long as there is safety measures in place. Masks for teachers, masks for kids, cleaning protocols in place. At the beginning of summer, it was 
told to us they will only be in school for two days. Well, that's not enough for my child to learn at such a crucial age. I'll take that over virtual learning. End. Dr. Comment? Green? Yes, is from Rebecca Darter, an AESD parent. Please prioritize the safety of our children and AESD staff and move all students to a 100% distance learning model for the foreseeable future. Please give teachers the flexibility and support to do what works for their students' grade level. Please be forgiving of working parents who may need the weekend to help children catch up on schoolwork. Please encourage school administrators to communicate and even over communicate with parents during these difficult times. Thank you to everyone at AESD for all your hard work over the past four months. End. Comment number three, submitted by Maria Alejo, AESD staff. Good afternoon, members of the board and cabinet. Let me start off by expressing my gratitude for your dedication to the safety of our children, staff, and community in AESD. I want you to know that I am excited to start a new school year with my preschoolers, but urge you to please vote to start classes virtually until it is safer for all of us to be teaching and learning in person. As a CSEA executive board member and classified employee, I'm also concerned for our jobs and hope that you will find us essential at AESD. Respectfully and appreciatively, Maria Alejo, preschool teacher, end. Next comment, Savannah Acevedo, AESD parent. As a parent that already testing positive for the virus a few weeks back, is very scared to send my child to school, especially being his first year going to school. We have to look out for our children. They are coming home to us after a day with other children and adults. We have to worry about our children, but also the teachers and the staff. We don't know how safe everyone is being at home or outside of the home. I don't think that, I don't think putting our children to the test, the waters is the smartest move to make. Please make the right choice and keep our kids safe at home. Thank you, end. Comment number five, submitted by Aurelina Sanchez, AESD parent. Please open the schools. Kids don't learn the same from computers. Cases are not even accurate, end. Next comment, Anthony, AESD parent. I want my kids back on campus because online class is not good for the kids. Stress, it's stressful because complicated related computer problems. Coronavirus doesn't affect kids. It is affect adults. Stay home, not healthy, fat, YouTube, and game addicting. I want two days on campus, three days at home. End. Comment number seven, Angela Henderson, AESD parent. Hi there. First of all, I would like to say thank you to all of the teachers and staff members and everyone who worked for the District of Anaheim. We appreciate you. I am very concerned parent of an elementary school student, a junior high school student, and a high school student, all of which prefer to participate in another round of distance learning. I feel that is the safest and wisest decision for my children. I feel like I would deliberately be putting them in harm's way by allowing them to return to public school with these rising COVID-19 cases. As parents, we are responsible for our children. We love our children and want the best for them. And what, and what is best for them is that they stay home. Thank you for your time. And please, please, please keep the schools closed. And Comment number eight, Melissa Flores, AESD parent. My children will not attend school due to COVID-19 and we are not going to risk my children to get the COVID-19 or any illness. The school needs to think of a better plan than to send them to school every, every county shut down going to school and there be doing online classes and Orange County is the only one that wants to open school. End. Comment number nine, Christina, AESD parent. What is your step-by-step -step plan if teacher, staff, custodian, student, or after-school staff are exposed and or test positive for COVID? 
What are the protocols that will be followed? Will the district provide testing for teachers and students prior to the start of the school? If no, why not? Your current proposal would be a hybrid two days at school, but how would that work when you are planning on having all day care at the school for kids on their non-school days? Where is the social distance? Where will the students be placed? At the lunch tables? There already is shortages of classrooms at most schools. How would this plan work and Comment 10, Yesenia Ibarra, AESD parent. Hi everyone, my name is Yesenia and I have two students in the Anaheim School District. And even though I love for my kids to go back in person class sessions, I would not send them this school year because I have a child with asthma and I would not want to expose him to this virus. If mandated to make them go back to class, what assurance would you give me that my child would not get sick to this virus? I believe in my heart that my children are safer at home and I'll do everything to help them with distance learning. I support this 100%. Thank you for listening to my words. End. Comment 11, Ashley, AESD parent. Would there be help for kids that are below grade level or kids that have special disability and need a professional help to get them through the school year? My son is far below grade level and this will jeopardize his ability to learn along with his peers. I hope we can follow through for those who need the help. Most of all resources for the ones who need it and can't do it all at home. This will stop them from falling more behind. End. Comment 12, Adriana, AESD parent. I would like to see an online school education because our young children are not yet responsible for taking care of not touching their face all the time. It's absurd that high school students be protected better than elementary school students. Thank you. I trust that our Anaheim Elementary District will opt for online classes. Comment 13, Brett Kaufman, AESD parent. Thank you for all of your attention to the ongoing pandemic. We support online only classes for the fall as long as needed. If it is possible, one suggestion, a simple controlled in-person outdoor meet and greet of 30 minutes would go a long way to ensure a successful online experience for the year. Kids do better online with teachers and friends they know from quote, real life end quote. It's hard to quote, meet, unquote, for the first time virtually. It could even be a drive through meet and greet. Thank you. Comment 14, Anna Epi, AESD parent. Opening the school back up with temperature checks and close checks of the staff and students will be a better option to not open at all. I understand the situation but it's not okay that our children will have to be impacted again. I'm not, qual I'm not qualified to teach my child. Online does not work for every student. How far will students be behind when this is over? Have options for students. Create waivers for families that need, to, need the kids back in school for learning. Do a hybrid classroom and divide the students so we can maximize social distancing. Make classes such as speech therapy and other special instruction available for students. Mental health is very important for our children now. Have counselors reach out to students. If our children not allowed to go back to school, let's redirect all the resources to benefit the student by support and options for one-to-one -one support. My children are not learning anything on a remote instruction setting. There has to be more options for families. What is the purpose that I can't send my kid to school, but I could send him to a YMCA for childcare. There need to be options, not, a, not another complete shutdown. End. Comment 15, Maria Rosas, AESD parent, originally submitted in Spanish, but translated to English. I am very concerned that the contagion of this pandemic is increasing. So I believe and wish for the welfare and health of my own children who should not return to school yet until they know that there is no risk. I would like classes to be online, but live so they can interact with the teacher live. I know there is going, 
I know there is an academy that offers classes online, but I don't want my child to stop belonging to the school in which he's already enrolled. Thank you very much. And I wish that the decision taken is the right one. Always ensuring the safety of children. End. Comment 16, Gloria Negrete Lopez, AESD parent. As a former student of Anaheim Union High School District and Anaheim Elementary School District, I am utterly appalled by the fact that you all have not made any decisions regarding the upcoming academic year. Anaheim is number two in COVID-19 infection rates and opening up schools will make schools hotspots for the virus. Children are hyperactive and love to move around and play with each other. There is no way that teachers and staff can monitor the movement of each child at all times. My nephew has asthma, and if we were to get ill, who knows how his body will recover. My mother takes care of him now. Will he prevent from getting his caretaker ill? There has been no conversation to inform us, the parents, about the type of protection that will be provided for students staff, and teachers. Where will this funding come from? How can you, in good conscience, confirm the safety and health of our children when there is no nurse available at our schools full time? If you do open up schools, who will take the temperatures of the students, staff, and teachers? Will it be a medical professional? The COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated the wealth, the wealth divide across the country. It is no secret that the racial makeup of Anaheim schools is pri primarily Latinx. And opening up schools in disadvantaged areas will make certain children and their families as disposable. If deaths, if deaths of teachers and staff do happen, how will you deal with the psychological toll it takes on the students? That is unforgivable, emphasis. On July 1, 2020, Medical professionals wrote a medical report that studied the brain of children diagnosed with COVID-19. They found that children who are diagnosed with COVID-19 will have lasting neurological damage so much that the researchers do not know the extent. Knowing this is truly appalling that you all are willing to scar some children in the name of funding. I hope that you all with emphasis reject the notion that classes should be face-to-face -face for the academic school year. Instead, you should all be making sure that teachers, staff, and students have access to the internet and computers they need for classes. You should be talking to city officials to make the internet accessible to everyone despite socioeconomic status. You should all be prioritizing training for the teachers so they can better learn how to deal with mental health issues as it relates to their students. You should be training teachers to be competent to teach classes that center the voices of underrepresented communities such as Black, Indigenous, Immigrant, and LGBTQIA. As district officials, you should all be prioritizing the well being of our school community. You should be funding and sustaining our community to live well and thrive. I urge you to opt a distance learning curriculum and work on better preparing everyone for these changes, end. Common 17, Karen Moseri, AESD parent. I am a parent of two AESD kids and I am pro opening all schools with all needed precautions such as masks, daily sanitizing campus, minimize student count on classrooms and all the recommendations for safe reopening. We don't know when cases will drop again and can't depend on that for reopening schools. That, beside being educational institutions, is also mental and physical health for our next generation. We all need to learn how to live with COVID-19 since it's not going anywhere soon. End. Comment 18, Angie Lopez. Children need to go back to school. Children are the ones at a disadvantage here. The district was not prepared for distance learning. Children are not learning or benefiting at all from this method. There should be safety regulations to keep staff and students safe, but only distance learning should not be the only option. I am a single mother who has worked through the entire shutdown and for staff to believe they are above anyone else that needs to work is insulting. No one is being forced to work or go to school. They have the option of not working and not getting paid 
and parents have the right to keep their children home if they do not want to expose them, but expecting that it, but expecting that to be everyone's option feels discriminatory. If I have to pay for daycare, then I'd rather not enroll in a new school year and move to a district or school that will allow children to return to school. Both my children attend day camp. They are six and eight years old and understand to keep their masks on and keep their distance as well as disinfecting their area. They have yet to have a case of outbreak. No matter how I try to do the teaching, I am not a teacher and should not be expected to be the one when the school is getting the funding for their attendance. Using a million apps is not how these children learn, especially with emphasis for the dual immersion, which I have yet to find a good app for them to use the way they were used to learning. Children not receiving their education is far worse than the possibility of being exposed. End. Comment 19, Bertha Soto, AESD staff. Dear AESD board members, I want to thank you for always putting Anaheim Elementary School District students and staff health and safety a top priority. I trust you will vote on the best option on how to open the 2020-2021 school year for everyone's best interest. End. Comment 20, Noemi, AESD parent. Looking into the coming school year for my child, it is very important for my child to be able to be in a classroom learning environment in front of a teacher. With that being said, I understand teachers and other parents being careful to do so due to COVID. While distance learning sounds like a solution to the problem, we live in a city where not all parents are able to stay home and teach our children and have one or both parents working to make ends meet. With many parents having difficulty during this time with childcare and teaching children, etc., Poverty here in Anaheim is a big problem and some people not speaking or understanding the language and or having little or no knowledge of the child schoolwork may be a problem. Distance learning may not be the best solution to this city. We need our kids back in school and learning. During the shutdown of schools, my child was not able to interact with his classmates or teachers on social media programs and due to hacking or privacy laws, which I understand the concern, but in times of need, the children need a bit of normal for their mental state. Please have parents sign a social media waiver so they can do so. So the district is not responsible for legal action. We need to look into having or hiring new teachers to teach that are in better health and younger. So the older teachers in high risk can stay home and do the distance learning for children whose parents want them to take that approach. Thank you for your time and hope you all come up with a better approach than distance learning. End. Comment 21, Lillette Gonzalez, AESD parent. How does the district plan to improve distance learning to those with a learning disability? My child has dyslexia and ADHD. End. Comment 22, Krista. AESD parent. I think AESD should follow Santa Ana, Long Beach, LA, and San Diego and start the fall entirely online. Anaheim is seeing a huge surge in positive cases. End. Comment 23, Norma Trujillo, AESD parent, submitted in Spanish but translated to English. Is it possible that the next school year will start virtually for all students to take care of their health? And will face-to-face -face teaching begin in January 2021 if the COVID-19 situation improves? And Comment 24, Nancy Diaz, AESD parent. As a parent, I would love for my daughters to get the best education possible. And for that to happen, my children have to be healthy and safe. It's unfortunate that our children have to go through a crisis that is nowhere or even close to being controlled. I hope that the decision that is made is not for, with emphasis, money. Our kids' lives matter more than anyone's paycheck. If our kids are forced to go back, I will have to take my children out of this district, a district I grew up in. Please make the correct decision. Let's keep our children, their future safe. End of emphasis, end of comment.
Comment 25, Karina Andrade, AESD parent. Dear board members, as a parent, the well-being of my child is my top priority. As an educator myself, I understand the importance of face-to-face -face education for a child. However, due to the current pandemic, the opening of schools not only puts the risk of health of our students, but also those individuals working at schools. It is imperative schools stay closed and the district begins the school year via distance learning. Then transition to traditional or hybrid classes once it's safe to do so. Sincerely, Karina Andrade. End. Comment 26, Sang Do, AESD parent. Everyone is at risk. Some are high and some are low. All lives matter. Infection and death rates are on the rise. It is no longer a question. It is our wake up call and we must act diligently to win against one of the most dangerous death-causing viruses, COVID-19. When I think of my children and parents, if they had to die today because of COVID-19, what would I do to protect them? The answer is I would do anything to save their lives. The, the country leadership clearly failed to protect and unite the people in one of the toughest time periods of our life. This is the moment that we all must show our responsibility, not only to ourselves, but also to others. We cannot be selfish and behave recklessly. We haven't done it well enough in the past few months. We need to be more aggressive, take charge and control based on science and statistics, not some lies and misleading data. A step back is not a loss, but a win forward to the future. A journey to the future without our loved ones is meaningless. End. Comment number 27, submitted by Lisa Waldy, Labor Association Representative. Superintendent Chris Downing, Dr. Jose Pablo Magales, members of the board and cabinet. I am overwhelmed by the unquestionable strength and character of our ASD cabinet has shown during this time of our uncertainty. So much has changed in a short period of time. The world around us, our neighborhoods, gathering spaces, the places we work and call home. Life is in the midst of COVID-19, has sparked fear, frustration, and anxiety all around. It is easy for distractions, criticisms, and stress to creep in. Many times I have ached for the, quote, normal, quote, again, the Quote, normal of wonderful students chattering in the office, running at recess, and during lunchtime, singing and playing musical instruments, engaging and learning in their classrooms. Literally, overnight, students are now at home. Parents, grandparents, and guardians became the teachers. Life seemed to be compelled to a new, quote, normal, end quote, that has felt something akin to the, quote, the twilight zone, end quote, at times. The capacity and tenacity of our teachers and staff who stepped up to the challenging, to the challenge of adding distance learning to the many hats that they wear is amazing. Now more than ever, we must focus all of our energy on defeating this pandemic and the challenges associated with it. Nothing is more important than ensuring the health and safety of all staff, students, families, and communities. In this time of uncertainty, the district's continual effort to reassure our classified employees have been and will continue to be compensated is greatly appreciated. CSEA would like to thank the district for their due diligence in keeping us informed on a daily basis. We are fully committed to remaining calm and working together towards the well-being of our classified employees and community. CSEA would like to say, quote, thank you, end quote. Showing gratitude is one of the simplest, yet more powerful things we can do for each other. Lisa Waldy, President, CSEA 54, end quote. Comment 28. Alfredo Herida, member of the public. My, neighbor, my name is Alfredo Herida, and I'm a product of the AESD and AUHSD. My youngest brother is currently a fifth grader at Betsy Ross, and he's excited to start school again. He is unaware of the fact that he lives in one of the most infected zip codes in Orange County and that his parents and siblings worry about the reentry process into the schools that claim safety is of the utmost importance. I am writing to, I am writing to implore you 
all that a fully online school year is the only way I see myself breathing a sigh of relief for the safety of my brother. We shouldn't have to send children into dangerous environments for the sake of their educational rights. It is our responsibility as a community to lead by example. We cannot hold remote board meetings that consist of five trustees while sending our children into classrooms of 10 or more without being hypocrites. For the sake of public safety, don't let our students or teachers face this virus and protect them from such a threat. On, a re an, on an unrelated note, I want to thank AESD for supplying internet hotspots for students who do not have it so that economic barriers don't inhibit their right to an education. Please expand, if not maintain this policy to allow our students spaces to learn. End. Comment 29, Daisy, AESD parent, submitted in Spanish, translated to English. As a mother of two, I am very worried about the opening of the school because of everything that is happening. I am worried about sending my children there, knowing that every day there are more cases of COVID-19. So I do not agree that the school should open for the time being. I would like them to take classes at a distance, but it should be at school. I enroll them in and with the teachers who is in charge of them. We should put ourselves the shoes of all parents because it is worrisome because of what we're living through. I hope the decision you make is a good one, but I am not sure about sending my children." End quote. Comment 30. Jim Fury, AESD parent. I have an alternative to our distance learning. Everyone may not have a computer, but a household usually has a TV and a cell phone. There are plenty of public access have to use channels on TV that are over the air. You could transmit a class, teacher on the left, assignments on the right. Students could take a picture of the assignment, finish and text in the answers. Costs offset by ads from struggling businesses. I'm a retired engineer, audio visual expert, willing to help. I have a full plan, email me, end. Comment 31, Alejandra Sanchez, AESD parent. As a parent of two elementary school children, I would like to address my concern regarding the 2020-2021 year return to school. I am extremely concerned about my children returning to school with the pandemic being in no shape or form under control. How can you guarantee my children will not contract COVID-19 and bring it home to me? I am a high risk person. I suffer from various health conditions that is if I caught COVID, I definitely would be one who would need an ICU bed. And it kills me and leave my children without a mother, not only me, but many. My autistic eight-year-old child is already hard to deal with at school without COVID rules. Now I can't even imagine him not being able to wear a mask all day and keeping his hands to himself, even with a full-time aide. He needed someone to constantly be telling him to keep stuff out of his mouth. And then there is my 10 year old who hates social distancing and wearing a mask. He says he can't wait to go back to school. He also shares his concern about how drinking fountains are dirty and kids put their mouths on them. How there would be no way to stay away from touching surfaces that may be contaminated because he hardly ever saw anyone wiping them down. Anything in his school, my kids hate their masks. We are one of the families that are taking this pandemic very seriously, and we have chosen to stay home and away from people till we feel safe again. In the last three months, we have known of more than 10 people who we personally know who have contracted COVID. Two of them passed away. This is very serious. I hope you think about the children and the teachers and the staff and consider focusing on a better distance learning program and schedule. Children and teachers and staff consider focusing on a better distance learning program and scheduled even if one person gets sick at school, it's not much. Please don't put our kids and families at risk. This is not the time to be opening schools, cap in all caps. Do not play rush and roulette with my kids. Thank you for reading and listening to my comments, Alejandra Sanchez. And that, um, Alarm indicates that we have reached the 30 minute mark um, for President McCullough. Thank you. I would like to 
Yeah, I would like to uh, provide a summary um, for the purpose of uh, transparency. We received a total of 120 um, comments. 76 of them were a clear um, favor of distance learning. 24 were in favor of in-person learning. And 22 of them were more of questions or comment in nature without a clear indication. All of the comments will be posted on the website when the min minutes are approved next Thursday. Thank you very much, Elsa. Just to clarify, 76 in favor. Uh... 76 favor distance learning. Okay. 24 favor in-person, in some sort of in-person instruction. 22 were more comments or questions in nature. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Elsa and Dr. Mary Grace for reading out all of the public comments. Now let's move on to item three, closed session. The board will recess to closed session for discussion and or action on the following items. A, threat to public service or facilities, government code 54954.5E and 54957. Conference with Agency Council. Novel Coronavirus, COVID-19. Can I get a motion? So moved, Ruelas. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Discussion. Hearing none, let's move on to our roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Let's go ahead and go into closed session. Is this the closed session, you guys? No, Jackie, it is not. Let me try to send you the other can, invite. Can you send me a link? Because I, I, I'm not of getting course. it. I'm having all of course. Of course. Hold on one second. Thank you.
I don't hear anything going on in the meeting now. It's silent. Hi, currently the board is in closed session and should return shortly. Hello, everyone. Just in case that you're still listening in, the board has adjourned to closed session and should be returning shortly. To all of our callers that are currently logged in to the general session and you just joined, it is silent because the board is currently in closed session. So in about 10 to 15 minutes, we'll rejoin. You're welcome to stay on the line. I just know that some people just joined now and heard silent and silence and weren't sure what was going on. Thank you.
Elsa, Elsa could you re-announce your That's message? Right, Thank you. Thank you, Elsa, okay. is it possible for you to re-announce your message again? Good afternoon, everyone. You have uh, called in to a special AESD board meeting. Currently, um, the board is in closed session. So if you just logged in and you hear silence, um, it's because there's no uh, business taking place right now. As soon as they are done with the closed session, they will re-log back in. Thank you for your patience and thank you for joining us.
Once again, if you just joined this meeting, um, please be aware that the board is still in closed session. Um, as soon as they are done, they will resume the general session. Thank you for joining us today.
Hello, is this meeting still in session? The more you do it, you know what. Yes, works the meeting you. is still in session. They are currently in closed session. As soon as they return, uh, you'll be back on. Callers, just a reminder, please put yourself on mute. Callers, please put your phones on mute. Thank you. We have added some background music just so people that are joining know that there is something going on and that um, it has not ended. So for your listening pleasure. Board will be coming back to session shortly. We'll be turning off the music now um, and we will be starting the general session in about a minute. Thank you for your patience.
Okay, we'll be starting shortly. Um, Board President McAllis, if you are in, if you can confirm, and I know you will be doing a roll call of all uh, board and cabinet as well. Am I in, Elsa? Board Elsa, member, you're in, Jackie. Like, you're in, hear. Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. I see you, Jackie. We appreciate everyone's patience. This is a well attended meeting, and so um, we are just. Um, fine tuning some of the processes. Thank you. Board President McAllis is still trying to log in. We're working with him. So just um, a few more seconds, please. We are still working with Board President McAllis. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you everyone for waiting. We're working on it. We really appreciate your patience. We're in communication with Board President McAllis. He's actively trying, thank you. Testing, one, two, three. Yes. You're good, you're good. All right. I'm happy I'm in. <laughs> all right, everyone, is all our board members uh, present? Chris? Can we do a roll call? All right, I see Trustee Alvarez. Uh, board member Wellis, are you there? Present. Board member Philbeck. Present. Board member Lopez. Present. All right, let's go ahead and begin. Good evening, everyone. Or I mean, uh, let's see, it's still good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District, July 16th emergency board meeting. I am AESD board president, Paulo McAllis, and I call this meeting to order at 2.11 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of the meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows, by calling 219-281-4401. When asked, type in the pin 518-870-870. 775 followed by the pound sign. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para español puede conectarse por teléfono de la seguenta, seguente manera. Llame al 2602227319. Cuando se le pida presione el pin Tres cinco nueve cero ocho ocho siete siete uno 
y el simbolo pound. Board members, tonight all voting will be by roll call vote. When motioning or seconding an item, please state your name. For any items being discussed, please state your name before discussing the item. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move to item 4A. Report of closed session actions taken. There are none. Moving on to item five, special order of business. 5A, an overview of the latest Anaheim COVID-19 data. Presentation by Daniel M. Parker, PhD. Department of Population Health and Disease Prevention. Program in Public Health. Dr. Parker, you are welcome to share your screen now, please. Thank you, Elsa. Um, please let me know if this is actually coming through. We can currently see you, and as soon as the presentation is visible, um, I'll let you know. I would like to also let the public know that this presentation will be available on our website tomorrow for your viewing. Are you able to see my, my slide here? Yes, Dr. Parker, you may okay. proceed, please. Okay. Excellent. So, so um, my name is Daniel Parker. I'm an assistant professor at UCI. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. So I, I spend most of my time studying infectious diseases. Um, and what what I wanted to do, um, relatively briefly, is kind of catch you up to speed with um, the scenario, the situation uh, uh, of COVID-19 in Orange County. Um, but getting started with that, I want to kind of get a sense of how, how quickly moving of a disease uh, COVID-19 really is. So, so think about this. Um, the time between the point that you become infected and you start symptoms is usually about five days. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but usually most people get about five days. Infectiousness though can begin on day three, so like two days before you're actually feeling symptoms. Um, and this is, of course, tricky for us epidemiologists um, because it's it's easier to to get people to isolate if they're feeling sick. If you don't even know you're sick, it's it's difficult to to catch the disease. Um, so what that does is it gives us for thinking about contact tracing and acting people asking people to quarantine or isolate if they've been in contact with someone who's sick. That only gives us three days, um, so not very not very long. Um, again, this is a really really fast moving disease. And there's lots of lots of data coming out. The Orange County Healthcare Agency, if you if you've all been keeping up with their their website, they report data on the number of tests, the number of uh, newly reported cases, um, and the number of deaths that are um, due to COVID-19. And these data are a little bit noisy. Um, so perhaps the easiest way to look at what's going on with the overall scenario is to model the data. And that's what we've done um, with my colleague, Vladimir Vinin. He is, uh, this is his model that I'm presenting here. Um, and essentially what, what one, of the, one of the important outputs of this model is what we refer to as the basic reproductive number. So that's, that's R0, you might've heard of this in the, in the news recently. So that's the, the capital R with a little zero there. And what R0 tells us is on average, how many people one infectious individual would infect. So, so an R0 of two, um, if I was the infectious individual, that means that I would spread it to two people and those two people would in turn spread it to two more people and on and on. And that's, 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 a, that's a relatively high transmission. That means that it would grow very fast, the epidemic would. And this, this number is important because what we want is to get R0 below one, which would mean that the epidemic is contained and that the number of cases will decrease to zero eventually. But if we have an R0 that's above one, that means that the number of cases is going to continue increasing and how big that number is tells you how fast the numbers are going to increase. Um, and this will continue to happen unless there's some kind of an intervention, vaccine, something like this. So, so we really want R0 at one or below essentially. And what we've been doing with this model over time you can see the, the plots on the bottom, um, is we've been calculating R0 at different time points along the epidemic, right? So the epidemic really started in March. So if you're looking at this plot on the bottom left, the second from the left, you've got a, a point in the middle. That's the estimate of R0 at that time. And then we have some, some uh, credible intervals around that. You could kind of think of those as uh, confidence intervals. Um, so the point is our estimate of R0. You can see at the beginning in March, we had an estimated R0 of 1.5. 
Um, and then if you remember, um, we all experienced everything being shut down. We were all asked to um, shelter in place. Um, and this really brought down our knot. Um, so it decreased. It was even looking like it was below one for a period of time. And then more recently, around May, started creeping back up. And if you look at the last one here for, for in July, um, we've got an R naught. If you look at the point in the middle there, it's essentially the same as what it was at the beginning of the epidemic. So this worries me for a couple of a couple of reasons. One, um, this means that transmission is now basically occurring at the levels that we saw back in March. Um, but this is happening on a backdrop of much higher cases, right? So, so back in March, we were talking about, you know, we started off with maybe five, then we jumped to 10 in a couple of days and then to 20 in a couple of days. But now we're consistently reporting 800, 900 cases per day. Um, and, and this transmission is increasing. So, so this, is, this is a worrisome um, turn of events. We can use this model to also project um, into the scenario that things remain as they are now, what will happen to, to uh, daily reported deaths, um, to daily reported cases, that's the incidence in the middle here, and the number of people who have an infection on any one given day. Um, and and for, for this presentation, I'm going to focus on that prevalence. That's, that's the number of people who are infectious at one point in time. Um, and what you can see is, is if the current scenario continues, if nothing changes what's happening, um, then we're predicting that there, at any one given day, at the beginning of August, there'll be hundreds of thousands of people who are infected and infectious. Um, our our, our mid-prediction here is about 100,000 people. So let's, let's use that to think about um, what it would mean, for example, to open school. So this is for Orange County. If we have 100,000 individuals that are infectious on some day in early August, this means that roughly 3% of the OC population is infectious on this day. And if a school district has say 17,000 students, we would expect 510 of them to be infectious on that day. This is a naive estimate, right? I need to point this out. This is smoothing across all of OC. If there was a higher burden, and there is in some areas, as I'll show you here in a, in a little bit, um, we would expect this number to be higher actually. So this is, this is a conservative estimate. Also, um, if the school district has, say, 1,000 teachers and um, 1,200 staff, then we would expect 30 teachers and 36 staff members to be infectious on that particular day. So, so what I hope to do is to give you some kind of a sense um, using this simple model um, of what you might expect, uh, what you might expect with regard to school uh, in, in August. Um, but now I'd like to also turn to thinking about the geographic distribution. So, so that model, it's, it's a very, it's a simplistic model. What it does help to do is to tease out, you know, if, if the cases are being driven by testing and this sort of thing. And clearly you can see, even when you account for testing, um, the, the trends and everything are up, right? So, so it's not testing that's doing this. Um, the geographic distribution of COVID-19 and OC is also, it's important to consider here. Um, the way I'm going to show this is by the use of maps, um, and I'm reporting the, the number of cases per 100,000 people per week. Um, areas that have very low reported cases will be shown in yellow. Um, and then areas with really high reported cases will be shown in this really dark blue or purple color. And I'll, I'll show this across time. And, and also importantly, you can see on the top of this map, I have highlighted in with the uh, white borders, the zip codes that I think would be of importance to you. Um, so, so beginning in March, beginning in March, um, you can see that the highest burden areas were essentially along the central coast area. So that's, that's Laguna Beach, um, Newport Beach, Corona Del Mar, those areas had the highest numbers of cases at the very beginning. This quickly changed though. Um, in April, case numbers were increasing almost throughout the county. Um, you're starting to see uh, higher caseloads up in the north central area. So we move in May, you can begin to see a, a cluster, a strong cluster developing around uh, Santa Ana there. And then now as we move through June, um, you see big, big hotspots, big clusters in, in uh, Santa Ana area and Anaheim area. And so you kind of have to take with the background that our modeling, our modeling um, exercise there that I presented, this is assuming um, a smooth distribution across all of Orange County. But the reality is that the heaviest burden of this disease are in a couple of places. Um, so in those places, you would actually expect a higher, a higher burden of disease, higher numbers of cases um, than, than what our model is predicting. So as with all infectious diseases that I've ever looked at, 
malaria, Zika, dengue fever, um, they're, they're never evenly distributed across the landscape. They tend to cluster in, in specific places. Um, and currently, uh, there, there are large hotspots of COVID-19, especially in the Anaheim and Santa Ana area. So, so with that, um, I can stick around a little bit and, and answer any questions if you have them. Um, yes, yeah. I'm sure our board members have questions. Uh, Dr. Parker, thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, for presenting this afternoon and also presenting to our reopening committee uh, mm -hmm. with your data. Uh, board members, at this time, do we have any questions for Dr. Parker? And do I, uh, do, do I need to call on people? or um, So, so I, I think I saw, I, I may I not even see everybody. So I saw uh, Juan Alvarez first, maybe? or Yeah, I do, or we can go in order. It doesn't matter to me at all. I, that, that, that would be fine, yes. Am I good? Okay. Uh, there's a there's a rumor going around uh, that's being perpetuated even by the Orange County Board of Education that children cannot be uh, carriers of this infection and that cannot be a vector to our communities. And I wanted uh, you if, if you could explain the science behind the the lie. Basically, if you could kind of explain your way through that. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So I think where this comes from, well, let me preface this. There's a lot about this disease that we don't know. So if you have people that are telling you any absolutes, then you should be a, a real scientist is going to be a little cautious about things. But here's what I can tell you for sure. There's, there's with increasing age, there's an increasing risk of death from the disease and severe disease. This is probably related to comorbidities. Uh, which are also related to age. Um, older people tend to be more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, um, COPD, things like that. And that's what, where you see lots of the burden of death occurring. Um, but we don't really have a whole lot of reason to think that children can't get infected. Um, I'm operating off of the assumption that they can be infected, but that we just see less severe de disease um, in children than we do in older ages. And, and it looks, so, so if you think back to the beginning, there was a real limitation in testing, a test they weren't widely available. So the only people you were seeing at the beginning were people who were deathly ill, and these were mostly old people. So it skews the data a little bit um, in that direction. Um, but there's no real reason to think that, I've seen no conclusive evidence to suggest to me that children can't get uh, can't be infected and spread the disease. Um, and in fact, we do have some cases, not as much as in older people, um, but with severe disease in younger children as well. Kawasaki's disease, it's not, it's not as common as in older, uh, older people, but we, but we do see this. Trustee Philbeck? Right, so can I, oh, can I go ahead. continue? Uh, so um, what I'm hearing you saying is that ch our children can, although they might not be as symptomatic as adults, can be the carriers and a vector of this disease and it's specifically a problem in our zip codes because our families live in high density neighborhoods and they cohabitate with a lot of adults within the space they live in. And that is what is worrisome because then we would be spreading the disease, perpetuating it exponentially and harming our families. Uh, am I correct in saying that? Is it, yes, essentially this is my concern, exactly, yeah. So, so again, there, so we, we don't have, I, I would like to have studies very detailed studies on children to say for sure that they are equally as susceptible and can spread as equally as adults, but I have no reason right now to believe that they don't. And so I'm operating under that assumption um, be because that's exactly what I am worried about. Yeah. Yeah. Trustee Philbeck. Thank you for such an informative presentation. Um, my uh, first just a clarification because we're, our numbers were in March and we're about there again. We're about at the same point. But a lot of people want to relate that to the increased testing. They want to find a relevance there. And I just wanted to clarify that you're saying the increased testing is not relevant Absolutely. to that. That it is, not, it is not skewing those numbers to, you know, we really are going in the wrong direction. That is correct. So, so the trend that you're seeing now cannot be explained by testing. It cannot. The, okay. So that's right. I At the very beginning, it could. So, so back in March, I think the hot spot around Newport and those areas, I think that had everything to do with testing. Those people had access to testing, but now it, it cannot be explained now. Okay. And then just as a curiosity, I know we're, you know, back down to, I think, uh, uh, outdoor dining or restaurants shut down and things. So I see the impact this could have on our district based on, especially uh, you explained that infection can be on day three or can, mm -hmm. you know, can be contagious on day three, even with no symptoms. And I'm just kind of curious, curious if you have a thought 
or if you have any um, opinion on the impact that might affect us, like, for instance, with downtown Disney being open. And even though it's a, it is an outdoor, basically outdoor venue. I mean, you can go in. I think there's 26 shops open. You know, we if we don't do the schools or we don't have that, are we... I'm kind of not sure how to say it, but are we really helping ourselves here? Um, is is there likely to be an impact? I mean, they've been open a week, and I haven't necessarily heard that there is. What's your What's your opinion on open venues like that? Like if you know Disneyland opens up again. So, I don't want to put on the spot, but yeah, you know, it's, and, it's and a difficult. Not, you know, I'm not negative at all. I'm just really curious, yeah. as a lot of people are, about how that could. And, us or if it already is. so so let me so so i have to i have to answer this as a, as an epidemiologist i'm not an economist of course right so i don't want to dread into that realm mm -hmm. um and what i what, what i am most concerned about is big groups of people indoors together that's that's what really sort of frightens me with this disease and that's that's where we really seem to see the highest transmission if you have people indoors big especially big groups of them um, this could be households. You see tons of it within household transmission, also in, in jails, uh, in boats, uh, ships, cruise ships. So that's where you really see transmission. So big groups of people, I personally am going to avoid big groups of people unless I really have to be in there. Um, uh, and if I'm going to be there, I'm going to be wearing a mask uh, and, and washing my hands and practicing hygiene. Um, and I'm going to... I mean, we all have to kind of weigh... We all have to make calculated risks. We can't just stay inside of our houses forever. Um, and again, I don't want to. I don't want to tread into the economic impacts. I know. I know they're real and severe, and uh, um, and I'm not an economist, so so I can't say whether or not I, it's it's not really my place to say whether or not Disney should have opened. But I personally am going to avoid big groups of people unless I, I really have to do something like get food or something like that. Yeah. And last question: yeah. Is it possible on you know that's like a large scale? And like I said, I, I haven't heard of any impact, and it's been open. Oh. I didn't address that too. I would, ex I'm usually when I see a, I, wait for two weeks, wait for two or, wait for two or three oh, weeks. Okay. That was sort of what I was getting at is if we were going to see an impact, when would it be and most likely to be? So that was kind of what I was getting at in your opinion. Cause you know, I haven't heard anything or seen that it is impacting us, but if it were going to, it'd be about two weeks that we would yeah. see the possibility. Okay. And then the last question on the very smallest scale, what about things like people that live in buildings that have elevators and such? What is, is it, you know, even though somebody's in an elevator and they're careful, they use a Kleenex to touch the buttons or whatever. What's, uh, what's your opinion on, is that a transmission? You know, can it be transmitted easily? Like in small spaces, such as elevators. I don't know. I'm, I'm seeing it's some reports on that. It could. You, you just want to think about the amount of time that you're spending with other people in that short, in that small enclosed space. So, so usually, um, unless it's an enormous building, I guess, usually you're not going to be spending that much time in there. So if you're going to be crammed into an elevator with people, if, I mean, if you can't avoid that, then I would wear a mask. Or take the stairs. Yeah. I would wear a mask, wash my hands afterwards. Um, yeah, that's 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 my approach. I mean, we can't avoid everything, but it seems like what it really it's really looking like how most transmission is happening. It's from it's from droplets coming out of people's mouths, um, probably directly into people's airways, like inhaling it or in their mouths if they're talking as well, or maybe in their nose or eyes. Um, so you just think about that. It doesn't it doesn't travel. It probably doesn't travel very long distances, but that seems to be incre increasingly that seems to be the main uh, route of transmission. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Board members, do any other board members have any questions for Dr. Parker? Yeah, this is uh, Lopez. I have a question. Um, thank you for the very informative presentation, Dr. Parker. Uh, just wanted to ask in your uh, expert opinion or your recommendation, uh, would it be your uh, recommendation that as long as our board or any other board of education for that matter are meeting virtually, that it's probably not safe for our campuses to be open to our students? It's um, so I, I think I have to be a little bit careful about uh, about official recommendations, but it is it is a it is ironic at least that if, that if that if we don't feel uh, careful enough to be in a group of people, and I don't think we should be in groups of people unless we have to, um, then yeah, it's there, there's a big irony there, of course. 
I, I hope I've I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Parker, I just want to say thank you for your really thorough and informative presentation. I really appreciate it. I don't have any questions or concerns on my behalf. You really uh, provided us with a lot of valuable data. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Dr. Downey, can you add? Uh, I, I believe you have some stuff to add before we vote on this item. Yes, Dr. McCullough. Thank you. Um, I'm also going to share a couple of slides. And again, this will be accessible to the public as soon as tomorrow. And uh, we heard from Dr. Parker um, regarding the fact that on a typical day of a district our size, we might expect as many as 510 students to have COVID-19, as many as 66 staff members to have COVID-19. Um, as we look at our process in analyzing this data and, and asking you board members to make this decision, I wanna let the public know that yesterday we held a meeting with our AESD School Reopening Advisory Committee. Uh, our participants included board members, uh, certificated and classified leadership and staff, administrators, parents, and community partners. And there were over 120 participants and they passed the following recommendation that during this special meeting, today and based on the rising COVID-19 cases in Anaheim, it is recommended that the AESD Board of Education prioritize the safety of students and staff and begin the 2020-21 school year with distance learning until further notice. Uh, this recommendation was voted on by the participants and as you can see, 93.8 participants 93.8% uh, again support this recommendation to the board. Additionally, uh, we've received input from our teachers association and I'd like to briefly read to you uh, a letter from Faith Daverin president and it reads, good afternoon school board and cabinet members. On July 14th, AEA's Executive Board adopted the position of recommending that the Anaheim Elementary School District reopen schools using a 100% distance teaching and learning model. The adopted motion stated, due to the significant increase in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths in Anaheim and Orange County, the AEA Executive Board recommend that the AESD reopen schools using a distance learning model to protect the lives of our members, students, and families. AEA, AEA understands that moving to a 100% distance teaching and learning model is a challenge for the entire school community. Distance learning does not mean less work for our members, it means more. Our members want to be back at school with their students. Distance learning requires more parent participation and assistance. Students can become frustrated with the technology and the inability to be with their teachers and friends. And while all of these are very valid concerns that should be taken into consideration, none of these should overshadow the health and safety of our staff, our students and their families. Prior to adopting our position, AEA tracked and studied local COVID-19 data. The data clearly pointed to the pandemic becoming a significantly greater threat to lives today than it posed last spring when schools were closed and distance learning was first implemented. This is a time when leaders must make very difficult and sometimes unpopular decisions. AEA urges you to do the right thing by voting to start the school year using a distance teaching and learning model. Thank you, Faith Daverin, AEA president. Uh, next, we have a message from Lisa Waldy, President, CSEA. Uh, this one was read during public comments. Uh, I will highlight the fact that she states now more than ever, we must focus all of our energy on defeating this pandemic and the challenges associated with it. 
Nothing is more important than ensuring the health and safety of all staff, students, families, and communities. And again, this one was read uh, during our previous public comments. Uh, last but definitely not least, our administrators have weighed in. Good afternoon, board members and cabinet. As leaders for the district, we wanna see our students and parents return to school. However, due to the recent spikes in COVID cases in the county, there are so many variables that threaten the progress to return to school safely. Asthma is in support of 100% distance learning until it is safe for our students and school community to return to school. Thank you for your time and consideration, Dr. Emma Robles, asthma president. Therefore, uh, board members, based on the COVID-19 data, which I might add um, on the OC Health Agency website, shows over 279 cases of students between the ages of zero and 17. And I would invite the public to check that website. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the prioritization of the safety of students and staff and begin the 2020-21 school year with a 100% distance learning until further notice. Please know that our staff will implement a comprehensive plan including daily live instruction, weekly engagement, record keeping, verifying daily participation, and tracking assignments. Thank you, Board President. Thank you, Superintendent Christopher Downing. All right, moving on to 5B. It is recommended the Board of Education approve to prioritize the safety of students and staff and begin the 2020-2021 school year with distance learning until further notice. Staff will implement a comprehensive plan, including daily live instruction, weekly engagement, record keeping, verifying daily participation, and tracking assignments. Can I get a motion? So moved. Ruelas. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Alvarez. Seconded by Trustee Alvarez. Discussion. Do you, do you want to go in order or can I just, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, go for it, for, Jackie. For probably Dr. Grace. Um, well, ironically also, I wanted to just point out that, and you know, having read all of the uh, public comments that we had, you know, we had access to those. In fact, I barely slept last night because I just, you know, kept uh, thinking of all of these, you know, points that were being brought up pro and con. I, I don't see how we can effectively ensure the safety of our students, teachers, or staff at this point. No matter what we do, and and we're pretty good at our. Uh, protocol and what we, you know, what we were going to have in place to do should we have um, opened and a blended, but you know, I, I just don't see us being able to do that. But what I thought was kind of interesting is that everybody is kind of, it seems to at least be seeing this as a classroom um, situation and as a classroom discussion when um, nobody mentioned transportation. That we also have mm. another whole component of this, which is transportation. We transport thousands of students. And so, you know, and all elements of uh, sterilization and sanitation and distancing and everything have to be applied. But just it's not really a point except just to say, hey, it's not just a classroom thing. We also have components of this that are, you know, added to this. And one of those is uh, transportation. But my one of the things that uh, my question for Dr. Grace is, and I'm sorry if I I'm not up to speed on all this, but one of the things that stuck out to me over and over and over in some of the public comments was parents or, or people that said either they were not qualified to teach or were not teachers, which could mean different things. Not qualified could mean, you know, a little bit different or they're just flat not teachers. They're not home. They're they're working. They don't have the access. So I was kind of curious, Dr. Grace. Um, if we could maybe define that a little bit more by either through those people or some other parents, because I'm wondering, okay, does that mean 
they're not understanding the curriculum or having trouble? Does that mean they, like I said, they're working? Are they having tech problems? Are their children resisting? Is there, the parents of the special needs children were also saying, you know, they, they're having trouble getting what they need for those students. So is there a way that we can define that a little bit more to possibly um, have the support or streamline that support to those parents when, can we determine what they mean by they're not qualified to teach or they're not teachers? Like it could mean several things. Are we, are we able to do that? Uh, yes. One of the things that we did as a district at the end of um, the school dismissal is we did provide a, a survey to our students uh, regarding their experience in distance learning. Also, you have to remember that when we dismissed back on March 13th, it was in an emergency situation. And while we had the best um, tools and our teachers did a great job adapting and providing the best asynchronous instruction that they could, we were not able to provide live instruction to our students in their homes. We as a district have um, invested in using Microsoft Teams, which is going to be a very secure um, in-house controlled uh, video conferencing method. So that will help provide the live instruction to our students. In addition, we've been making, we're going to be making videos and providing training for students and families to be able to easily access and um, provide feedback to us during the distance learning that will happen in the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you. And you kind of answered what my next question was because one of the parents did ask, from where we were when we started, how will this, our new online academy, will it be the same or will it differ? And I think you've kind of answered that, that we're expanding because of where we were when we started, which was an emergency basis, and where we're being able to streamline this and head into it much more effectively. So that kind of answers that. And the last question was, parents were also concerned about, um, the lack of socialization that this pandemic has caused for their children that they used to get through us. So any thoughts on um, how we're going to, or how we can increase that? Yes, I think that um, with the utilization of the Microsoft Teams, that it, it won't be live interaction, but it will be um, interaction and uh, they'll be able to talk to each other. The kids will be able to talk to each other. They'll be able to talk to their teacher. You can set it up so that the whole class is showing somewhat like what we're seeing with us on our video so that there will still be a little bit of that interaction. And we, um, our plan first and foremost is uh, built upon our social emotional learning curriculum and ensuring that we make sure our kids and their families are in a good uh, space emotionally before we start teaching them again through an online academy. We also are offering live sessions every Wednesday. Our counselors are on uh, Google Meet providing support to our parents and families. And we'll continue to do that throughout the the foreseeable future while we're in distance learning again. Thank you very much for all of that information that pretty much um, you brought forward pretty much everything that I needed. Thank you. All right, board members, any other things to discuss? No, nothing. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Juan. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just uh, one comment came to mind as we were listening to the, the, the comments for today. Was it somebody mentioned, I think it was a parent, uh, could I guarantee that their child would not contract COVID? The answer is no. But I could definitely guarantee that if we go back to campus, people will get COVID and people will die, right? And that's the severity of the situation we're in. And we have to make the decision to save the lives of our community members. And that's where we're at. And I know it's not the ideal situation. We're in this crisis together and no one's comfortable with it. Everyone's stressed out about it, 
we, we have to come to a conclusion about how do we save the lives of our children and our families. And I'd rather have my, my son miss a few months of in-person instruction, even though he's gonna be getting instruction online. I'd rather ha sacrifice those months of time with the teacher in life person and have them alive at the end of the year. Right? I want my child to be alive. And I know I want the, ch the children of our families to stay alive. And I want our families to be alive. And that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. All right, Trustee Ruelas. Um, yeah, and you know, to just piggyback off of both my colleagues' uh, comments and whatnot, you know, obviously this is a, a really big, you know, decision that we have to make and whatnot. And I totally understand the concerns that were expressed in public comments. Um, Mike, you know, Trustee Philbeck, I myself also, I know all of us actually probably did, uh, spent a lot of time reading through these because of the fact that, you know, your, your opinions and, and your concerns matter and we take this very seriously. Um, and, you know, I, I, I understand, you know, some of the, the, you know, complexities of it all and, and whatnot, but really when it's all said and done, um, you know, the only way to ensure the safety of our students and their families as well as our faculty and staff and AESD is to go 100% virtual. And, um, you know, I'm, I just really um, in, would uh, like it to be known, you know, and I just wanted to be clear to everybody that, you know, when we make this decision and that is going to be the direction that we're going down, um, although at the end of last, you know, school year in March 13th, that Friday, it was far from ideal, you know, I do want to just send a, give AESD kudos because I think that we did a really good job in regards to handing out hotspots, ensuring that students had technology, et cetera. Was it perfect? No, it wasn't, but like, no, I think in comparison to a lot of other places, uh, especially here in Orange County, we did a, a fantastic job and, and, and just want to just give them praise there. Um, I firmly believe that with the great team that we have in our educational division, led by Dr. Grace as well, um, her team's going to do a great job by providing the appropriate professional development to ensure that our students are receiving lessons that are more dynamic, engaging, and of course framed around the appropriate standards for online learning. You know, and um, like I said, I just feel strongly that. Um, we in AESC can do this, um, and I'm confident that we will do this for our students um, this upcoming August. So, thank you, Trustee Ruelas. Trustee Lopez, anything to discuss? Thank you, President Magalis. Um, just a couple of comments. Uh, I would also just like to thank all of our participants who are on the line with us right now for enduring the past two hours. Uh, I know this time represents to them other obligations that they might have uh, been filling their day with. So uh, they're on because it's important to them, um, because they're passionate about this. Uh, it's something that we all take seriously. Uh, I also want to thank them for uh, those who submitted comments to us uh, via email. Um, I did read all of them up until as of uh, about 12 p.m. today. So if there are any more that have come in, um, I look forward to, to hearing from our parents and our uh, uh, staff and all of our other stakeholders. Um, I just want to also um, note that the motion, uh, as I understand it, is until further notice. So this is not a permanent change. This is something that uh, we'll be mon uh, monitoring, and uh, we can always come back to this at a later date. Uh, that concludes my comments. Thank you. President right. Michaels, I had another question. Yeah. Once you, if you would like to go first, or I had one more question. Yeah, I, I, I mean, all I have to say with, and thank you, Trustee Philbeck, uh, my decision, and I've said this from the get-go of this event, uh, these unprecedented, these unfortunate events in our nation and our world's history is that as an elected official, my top priority has always and will always be the health and safety of not only our students, our staff, but our families and our neighboring community, especially the elderly. I'm ex incredibly uh, worried uh, about, uh, you know, COVID spreading even more. Uh, I don't want any lives 
uh, any more lives to be lost during this unfortunate. Uh, uh, and I also want to use this opportunity to say thank you to our cabinet for working so hard. Uh, I know there was a comment out there that there was no plan. We've been planning this for, since March, since we closed. In fact, I know a lot of our board members are our board members alone. I've seen you all in meetings, CSBA, uh, OC. Uh, uh, and uh, with Orange County Department of Ed, I, I've seen, you know, tons and tons of uh, board members and cabinet in, engaged in uh, multiple plans. And uh, and I'm sure you all know that we have a reopening committee of over 140 plus teachers, uh, parents, uh, staff members, administration that have been working diligently. Uh, and, and I'm incredibly proud of all of you for participating and giving uh, your input on that. Uh, so just know that tonight my vote is based uh, on all of the recommendations uh, from all the various stakeholders and again, the health and safety of our staff, our students and our neighboring community. Go ahead, Trustee Philbeck. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, I know it's our job to educate. I take that very seriously. We all do. This board is very cohesive and very um, together as far as our what our responsibilities are as elected officials to educate. But I think we can do that. And I think that we're going to do that very well without risking lives. Because um, on a more of a personal kind of direction, we have to consider, too, that it's not just the people that are going to be on site, um, our students and our, our staff and our teachers. Um, I do know of some, some kids that have tested positive, so it does affect our students, it will. But what I, also, what I really want to say is, we've got to look behind those people because for instance, if I was an employee, I would be extremely uncomfortable coming back in this environment because my mother is 90 years old. So there's faces behind every employee and every student that as, um, you know, we were told in the presentation, this is nothing to mess with. This can directly um, kind of go down that line like dominoes. So I understand why our, our staff and our employees are nervous about this. And I have to say I, I would be too, but I think we'll be able to educate strongly. And my question, which was going to piggyback on, um, on Mr. Uh, Lopez's, question or, or the line where he was going was is to Dr. Downing and as um, board member Lopez said you know this isn't forever we're you know we're, we're going to be continually re-evaluating that and uh, according to what our reports are and what our, our recommendations are but Dr. Downing do you see us perhaps um, maybe sort of reevaluating this going into as early as September October so that we can give people kind of a time frame of, yes, we're going to do it now, but, you know, we're going to revisit this conversation based on the data that has is going to be collected between now and then. Because I know, Dr. Downey, you and I had had a conversation. Or what do you think is realistic about that? Just so our parents have something to kind of look forward to. Uh, Board Member Kobeck will continue to monitor uh, the data, especially here in Anaheim, and we can provide updates uh, to families and the community. Uh, we can additionally discuss the data in our ongoing board meeting. Um, the national trend is that data is rising on a daily basis, so I, you know, I wouldn't want to speculate about when that trend is going to change. At this time, what I can say to our families is uh, you will have our support. Our distance learning will be more interactive. You will see a noticeable difference. We will help those families that are struggling. And we are committed as a district to safely reopening when we can. Uh, and we will use data and our conversations with, again, health agencies as our guide. Yeah, I actually meaning to speculate so much on when it would end or the trend would end but you you answered it i was leaning more towards how are we gonna how often are we gonna update you know, are we gonna get a continual update on this and and let our our um, partners and our parents and our stakeholders and our uh, staff 
regularly know what we know so that we can kind of keep everybody in the loop and um, you know, how this is going. And you answered that. So that would be my recommendation also is that we do that, that we, you know, they're in this with us. Let's keep everybody sort of informed and updated as much as, as our board is as much, much as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Any other things to discuss before we vote board members? Hearing none, let's go ahead and do our roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. All right. Thank you to the 249 people who uh, joined us uh, this in this afternoon's uh, special board meeting. Uh, I adjourn this meeting at approximately 2.58 p.m. We hope you could join us at our next board meeting next week on July 22, 2020. Be safe out there and God bless everybody and our country. Thank you. Good afternoon, Bye. everybody. Bye.